going and they just put like a few words on the slide. It's a lot of work, all that pressing. And then when the music doesn't coincide with the PowerPoint. <laughs> well, there we go. We did our best. So um, very, very quickly, this month, as we look towards, uh, sort of heading towards September, this month we're going to have, uh, some of you might remember him, John Squires is going to come <laughs> preach to us in the 22nd, 22nd of August. Originally, I was going to go and speak at another church, but that's been cancelled. So I booked him in to cover me, but he's going to be here and I'll be here as well, which would be nice. And if you don't know, John Squires is, um, well, he's, he's an in-law now because my son married his daughter so um he's still an in-law he's not become an outlaw yet you know what i mean we're still friends but you know there's time yet there's time yet to fall out with the with the outlaws like you do um, so that's um most of august then in september i'm going to be away so the beginning of september there'll be uh different speakers one of them will be my son then there's going to be uh, stephen skulls is coming and mark mark yudin is going to come as well uh, at the beginning of september and then after that i'll be back all refreshed, hopefully, after being on holiday, which I've not managed to do for a number of years, like most of us. But praise the Lord, excited for it. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to uh, take our needs before the Lord, pray, ask our God to move on various needs. There are a lot of needs. You can look out and uh, read the, the headlines, the newspapers, and you can see needs, can't you? You can just see that the world leaders... I've got a lot on the play at the moment with all manner of crisis going on. So we'll pray into that. If you have your own needs, take them before God. God is able. Uh, and we're going to keep uh, praying and contending for Auntie Beth, who I believe is back at home now. She's still in hospital. All right. Okay. So we're going to keep praying for her. We're going to keep praying for Enid. Um, and we're also going to pray for Sue Byrne and Jamie's mum, um, Rita. And if there are others, if you have a need and you want to take it before God, God will, he tells us, he hears our prayers, and our prayers are answered, the issue is always time scale, we've just got to trust him, okay, so let's stand and go before God, I'll pray, and if you, a minute at the end. Father God, we come before you, Lord, we're looking to you as always, the author and finisher of our faith, we have faith, and that's why we pray, Lord, and as we come before you, we contend and praying for what seems to be a world in turmoil at the moment, Lord. Lord, we need peace. We need the peace that is supernatural, like was mentioned before, Lord. We need wisdom for our leaders to know what to do, Father God. And as we contend for our own needs this morning, Father God, we trust you. We say you are our king. You are our savior. You are the one true ruler of all heaven and of all earth. We pray for Beth, for a healing, Father God. We rebuke sickness in that area right now, Father God. We pray for Rita and for Sue, for Enid and those that we've prayed for before, Lord. We do ask, as always, that you would move. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. While you stood up, go around and say hello to a few people. We'll have our little time of fellowship, and then I will bring God's word to us. So be as friendly as you can be.
Okay, if you could find seats, please. Well, you're in good voice this morning, which sure is a good sign. Uh, so while um, we uh, get ready for God's word, we're going to be on page what's 906 of these blue Bibles. So it's 906, these blue Bibles, if you want to follow um, what we're reading. We're going to go through chapter 8. I won't read all the verses all at once. I'm going to just do them in small chunks. It is the book of Hosea. Um, it's a, an interesting book, a powerful book. Um, and it's got lots of stuff in there for us to um, learn about our walk with the Lord, learn about what it is, what it means. So 906, chapter 8, the heading in this Bible says, Israel to reap the whirlwind. Um, and I've just called the sermon, you reap what you sow, you reap what you sow. Okay, so we'll just get into the first three verses, and then um, we'll jump into it. So it says this, put the trumpet to your lips, an eagle is over the house of the Lord. Because the people have broken my covenant and rebelled against my law, Israel cries out to me, our God, we acknowledge you, but Israel has rejected what is good, an enemy will pursue him. So we'll stop it there and I'll pray. Father, as always, this word is your word. It is something that is precious. It's something that is unique. Father, it is from you. It's from heaven. Lord, we pray our hearts be open and ready to receive. I pray that I would take a step back, that you be glorified. Speak to hearts in this place this morning. We want to know more of you. We want to learn about you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. So um, chapter eight is like an overview. So last week, uh, if you were with us, if we went through the, the chapter. The chapter kind of gave you little hints where the breaks were. So it kept having a repeating phrase. When you get a repeating phrase, in the Bible, it's a kind of a hint that something new is coming. Uh, and in this particular one, it doesn't seem to have that. So it's got an overview. And what it does do, what I've tried to do, is it talks about all the area of life where Israel was failing. Okay, so it looks at different areas of life and it says where Israel is going wrong. So the overview starts with these first few verses and the trumpet is, can be a celebration, okay? You, could, uh, you can celebrate with a trumpet. It has royal associations, and it can also mean there's a dire warning. In this case, it's a warning. The warning is an impending one. Blow the trumpet, there's a catastrophe ahead. That's what the writer is telling them. A modern-day equivalent would be the air raid warning, air raid warning system. Remember that? Well, I've say, do you remember it? I don't remember it, but, you know, some of you might remember it. Um, there was the air raid sound, then you'd go to 
the shelters and the government at that time wanted to protect the citizens so they built the shelters and they built the system and in a sense this is what Hosea is doing here he's saying blow the trumpet we need to let the citizens know that an impending catastrophe is coming come on wake up everybody that's what he's saying to them okay now just as an aside my next door neighbors their um, alarm that they you know they, they put their alarm on when they go to bed and sometimes because they're getting on up there in years they forget to switch it off in the morning so uh, it's, it's normally um it's normally it's called Derek lovely fella it's normally Derek who wakes up and he sets the alarm off in the morning and when their alarm goes off it sounds like an air raid it's like, so you, you know you know whose house it is every time you know what I mean so you'll be there like Saturday morning maybe you know having a lie in and so I always joke with them you know when it when it goes off and I see them I said oh I jumped behind my sandbags with my little tin helmet on when that and they're all like oh she's all embarrassed oh I know it keeps keeps setting the alarm off but this air raid warning system would be the modern day equivalent. Sound the alarm, something is going to happen. The reason for this catastrophe, these people, God's people, these special people, chosen by God, they've broken covenant. To break covenant was a serious offense. God had covenanted with them. He said, I'm going to be with you. I'll always be there for you. You are my people and I will be your God. I called you out of Egypt to be a special treasure. And they've broken away from him. He had remained faithful. They've broken off the relationship. Therefore, there is an eagle over the house and the eagle was a picture of a nation and the nation was Assyria and this nation was going to rise up and it was going to snatch Israel out of their homes out of their land and take them somewhere else however with God there's always a chance and so this first section is it's never too late it's never too late God gives warnings and even at this particular point if they would turned from what they were doing God would have just intervened and sorted it out but they didn't and you might say, well, we've heard this kind of stuff before in this book. You know, it's kind of like the same thing repeating. But at this particular one, there is a threefold condemnation. The first is a covenant. The second was the law mentioned in verse one. It says, looking down, I rebelled against my law. They had been given God's word. The only people on planet Earth that had been given it. And they'd rebelled. And then the third was in verse three. It says, Israel had rejected what is good rejected what is good now according to Derek Kidner his commentary he says this covers things like conscience and plain decency it's a, a demand or even that common sense suggests for good is by definition not only what is worth doing but what is worth having and what is worth being and to spurn this is to fall for a bargain that is no bargain at all and to spend your life we might add, for certain death. To spend your life for certain death. This was as serious as it gets. And in answer to this charge, as we will see, the Israelites, they choose self-reliance. They choose to trust in man-made objects. But even amongst all of this decadence, God sounds a trumpet, turn to me. He wants to gather his people, he wants to bring them to himself, and so the first point I want to make is it is never too late with our God. I became a Christian at 21 years of age. The first question that I wanted to ask God, why did I have to wait till I was 21? Why couldn't I have got it in my teens, missed out all the nonsense that I what got involved in? It's never too late. It doesn't matter about your situation. It doesn't matter about your background. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter about your job. It doesn't matter about your education. It's never too late with our God. He is able. His ear is open to the cry. He will hear. He will come. He will meet you. And God's first objection that he has with these people is in verses four to six. Okay, so let's look at four to six. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. 
With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves to their own destruction. Throw out your calf idols, Samaria. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of purity? They are from Israel. This calf, a metal worker has made it. It is not God. It'll be broken in pieces, that calf of Samaria. So the first section is the political element. They set up kings without my consent. They choose princes without my approval. And in this section, God uses the words they a lot. It's they, there, they, there. God is completely separate from them. He looks at these people, these people that were his, these people that he called, these people that he blessed, and he says, I'm separate from you now. God has set Israel up so that the kings of that time, they were appointed by God. God had put them there to guide the people. It was supposed to be a sacred post, a, a place where people would look to for guidance. That's what was meant to happen. And these individuals were meant to be men of God, chosen by God to lead the people of God. And you can see the same thing in the ideas and the kings and queens of England. It was Henry VIII who in 1534 made his, this act. He said, the act of supremacy under which the king recognized no superior on earth but only God, and no subject to the laws of any earthly creature. The only problem with that was that he thought he could make his own laws up. The point of recognizing God is to humble ourselves before the mighty hand of God. And these kings had not done it. But as it was in our royal history, their plottings and the assassinations, so it was with these people. And these, I suppose, in unstable leadership, which we're kind of seeing in our own society, aren't we? This unstable leadership that was happening here, that happened in our history, that's happening before us because we don't seem to be able to decide and who wants to be the leader of a particular party. This unstable leadership is probably something to do with the rejection of God. Israel was supposed to have a recognized king. This king was a man appointed by God. And what they got were various men not lasting long on a throne and achieving nothing of any value. But we, as God's people, don't just have the man of God. We don't have a king. We now have the son of God, do we not? The son of God, chosen by God, came to save a people and lead the people of God. We have King Jesus. And in this time and day and age that we're living in, King Jesus is a great comfort to me. Is it not for you? You think to yourself, some of the stuff that we're now seeing on our screens, some of the things that dominate our, our TV sets or the newspapers, I'm thinking, I'm glad I worship King Jesus. I'm glad he gives me peace. I'm glad he gives me a foundation. I'm glad he gives me a firm footing in times that are quite treacherous. The gospel says that we have got something far better in God's only son, a king like no other. That's what we've got, a king like no other, King Jesus. He rules, he's on his throne, and nothing happens without his say-so. We should take peace from that. There's a famous illustration of William Booth. I don't know if you know William Booth. He was the guy that set up the Salvation Army. Okay, led it all, and uh, they had a big, big move of God, and it, it touched loads and loads of parts of the UK, and they were known for marching under the, they used to have a, a flag that they would walk, march under, uh, and by the time he got to a ripe old age, he was recognized nationally by the king of that time. They wanted to give him some award, like a, an MBE or an OBE, something like that. I don't know what they wanted to give him. And the story goes, that as he goes to stand before the king, which I think was King George, as he goes down before the king, the normal accustomed would be to bow before the king. And William Booth apparently says, I bow before no king other than King Jesus. And he stood, he stayed, stood up. What does it mean to have Jesus as your king? What does it mean to you? Is he Lord of your life? You know, there are times, I've got to be honest, where being ruled by a King Jesus, sometimes I get a little bit uppity about it, if I'm honest. 
But King Jesus is our King. And to all intents and purposes, these people, they profess the faith. And as it says in verse 2, our God, we acknowledge you, but their words were empty. Their actions not consistent with what they professed. To carry the name of God on our lips requires a lifestyle to match it. From the political, we go to the spiritual. It says this in the second part of verse 4. With their silver and gold, they make idols for themselves. To their own destruction, Samaria, throw out your calf idol. My anger burns against them. How long will they be incapable of purity? They are from, they are from Israel, exclamation mark. This calf, a metal worker has made it. It is not God. It will be broken to pieces. Now, this golden calf that um, Hosea is pointing out here, it's got a long history with Israel. If you go back to when Israel was being first formed as a nation, and there was a, uh, there's a, a, a famous bit in the Bible where Moses goes up the mountain, and as he goes up the mountain, he's gone for such a long time that the people start to think that he's not coming back. And for some reason, maybe the influence of the local cultures, they want a different God. And they go and pressure Aaron, who was the high priest, and Aaron says, okay, and he, and he gets some metal and he makes up this, this uh, golden calf and he's, Israel, here is your God. And this calf, this golden calf had plagued the Israelites. It had plagued them. You fast forward to um, where we're at now and the kingdom has just been split. King David had a son, King Solomon. King Solomon ruled and at the end of his rule, his heart started to go away from God. And God said, because you not love me wholeheartedly, I'm going to split the kingdom. It'll be split into two. And so King Solomon had a son, and his son was called, got to get this right, Rehoboam. Okay, you've got a Jeroboam ruling, ruling and a Rehoboam ruling. You've got to get them right. If you get them wrong, you're in all sorts of trouble. So I think I've got it right that it was Rehoboam. Yeah, Rehoboam was his son. Rehoboam thinks he's got to lay down the law, lays down the law, splits the kingdom. And God says to Jeroboam, who is the first kind of king of that split nation, he says, if you follow me, your people, your family will stay on the throne. That's what he says to Jeroboam. And as soon as this kingdom splits, it, it says that Jeroboam, he looks and he realizes that for these people to live for God, they're going to have to leave his little newly formed little country and go to Jerusalem. And he says to himself, you know what? If they go to Jerusalem, they might not come back. He got a little bit scared. He got a little bit anxious. And this fear and this anxiety caused him to doubt God's word. And I want to tell you, you know, following God, it's risky. Amen. You want to follow God, there's a risk in following God. And if you've got a word, and we've got a full book here, and he had a word from the prophet, basically back then the prophet came up to Jeroboam and he said, this is what the Lord says to you. I will put you on the throne here for if, as long as you let the people worship God. And he, and, he, and he bawled it, basically. When it came to stepping out in faith, the fear factor gripped him, and he shrunk back and said, you know what? Let's go for calf worship. I'm going to stick one over here at the end on the border. I'm going to stick one over here. Wherever they walk, they can go and worship there. And he led the people astray. God has given us a whole book of promises. It is our business to chase after them. To get after them with faith, hearts full of faith. And to look at the risk and say, you know what? I put my trust in the Lord. I put my trust in the Lord. And being, taking risks means, you know, you have to sometimes step out and it might not work. I've done that loads. And it's okay to do that. Let's try this as a church. Hmm, didn't really work. It's all right. We've learned from that. God had given this man a word and he said, if you, if you believe my word, there's promise, there's blessing. Uh, you know, I've got good things for you. And this guy didn't have the faith. 
you know, I, I don't want it to be said about my life that I didn't have the faith for it. Honestly, do not want that. The, I, I fear not having faith. That's what I fear. That's probably a good fear, is it not? Yeah? I fear not having faith. Because God has got things for us. God has got things for us. God is at work. God is on the move. And the future in Christ, regardless of what society looks like, is bright. That's a good place to say amen. This week I went into work, did a day at work, sat in the offices, catching up with stuff, sorting stuff out. One of my work colleagues comes up to me. I've done a lot of work with her. So get on great. I said, I need to talk to you. I need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, you know, have a, let's have a chat. No, 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 we need to privately, privately. I'm like, oh, now, now I'm worried. It's not bad, it's not bad. So I'm right, right okay. Uh, well, when we go out um, and get everyone's lunch, we can have a natter on the way, like, yeah, yeah, let's do that. So we go out, picking up people's lunch, and we, as we're waiting for our subway order, we sit down, and, um, and she says to me, um, uh, and I'm like, just spit it out. You know what I mean? What is it? What is it? And she says, um, I don't know how to say it. And I'm like, just say it. You know, I'm on pins. What is it? What is it? She says, I've started going to church. I said, what? Man of faith. What? I've been going now for two weeks. I was like, like, you know, literally mouth open, you know what? Right? And, and, and I went in and, and, I don't know what I'm doing. I've never, she's never been in church before. So I'm like, well, what, what's the problem? She says, well, they said, in, in, I went in this church. So what type of church is it? It's the Church of England church. I said, uh, is it like near you? Yeah, it's, it's just around the corner. And she takes her son, and her son loves it because it's, it's all singing. He loves to sing. She says, but when it came to the Bible, they said it was in Mark 1, something 14. What's that? And I'm looking at her going, my goodness. You just don't realize, do you? You don't realize if people have never been in church before, they don't know. I said, well, Mark, um, that's in the New Testament, and one is a chapter, and verse 14, she says, before I went to church for two weeks, I prayed for two weeks. I'm like, wow. She says, but the problem is, like, no one in my family, either on her partner's side or on, on her side, goes to church, and they're all giving her a load of grief. What are you doing that for? What are you filling his head with that nonsense for? Why are you doing this? And I'm like looking at her going, I honestly can't believe I'm hearing this. You know what I mean? So she says, so, 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 uh, so, so what should I do? Should I read the Bible? That's a good idea. Is there a children's Bible? Should I read the children's Bible to my son? I'm like, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I'm like in this, I'm in Subway going, God is at work in all manner of way that we just don't see. We just don't see it. But we should believe it. Believe that he's at work. So closing this section off, hold fast to the promises of God. God is more than able to do what he said he will do. If you're praying for people, God hears. If you are prayed for a long time, keep praying for them. Because your prayers for that person who's not a Christian, they are life and death prayers. They really are. From self-appointed kings to spiritual delusion, there is no self-help. So we're now into diplomacy. So it says this in verse 7. Let's go back to our text in verse 7. We're going to read right down to verse 10. It says this. They sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. The stalk has no head. It will produce no flower. Were it to yield grain, foreigners would swallow it up. Israel is swallowed up. Now she's among the nations like something no one wants. For they have gone up to Assyria like a wild donkey wandering alone. Ephraim has sold herself to lovers, although they have sold themselves among the nations. I will now gather them. They will begin to waste away under the oppression of the mighty king. 
In Matthew 7, verse 15, Jesus says this, speaking about religious leaders, you will know them by the fruit. God says that he has seen the seeds that, he, that these people have sown. He's seen their deeds, he sees everything, and he's awarding them accordingly. God sees the way we sow. You and I, we reap what we sow. They sow the wind and they reap a whirlwind. Probably in our society is a phrase that has lost its shocking element, but it was meant to be something not as in if you don't do anything, don't, you, know, you don't get anything. That's not what it means. It's something along the lines of what Paul says in the book of Galatians, chapter 6, verse 8. He says, he who sows to the flesh will reap from the flesh destruction. And so as we're looking at these verses here, God is speaking to the people of Israel and he's saying, I've seen what you've sown and now you are going to reap what you have sown. Fast forward to the New Testament, the Apostle Paul says, he who sows to the flesh will reap. It doesn't say he'll reap disappointment. It doesn't say you'll be a little bit down. It doesn't say you'll be a little bit sad or a little bit upset. It says you'll reap destruction. We reap what we sow. Are we sowing to the Spirit? Or are we sowing to the flesh? That's what we need to think about this morning. You see, the devil is playing for keeps. We cannot be half-hearted in our understanding of things, in our devotion. It has to be wholehearted devotion. And there's loads of detailed passages about what the behavior of the people of God should look like. It is not a take it or leave it thing. It's not a, a little badge that you wear on a Sunday thing. It is a life and death thing. We'll pay dividends for what we've sowed into. We will all reap what we sow. In fact, I'm just going to turn there to that bit of Galatians and read out some of the things that he says we our old life and what our new life should be. I think it's Galatians chapter 4. Just bear with me a second. That might be, yeah, 5. So it says this, talking about the spirit and the flesh. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy. Now you can go through the vast majority of those first bits and go, not for me, not for me, not for me. But then you can go to jealousy. Have you ever been jealous? Yeah. Have you ever had fits of rage or anger? Yeah. Things that make you angry? Yeah. Have you ever had selfish ambition? Yeah. Have you ever had factions or dissensions in other words causing things to you know split apart you know what i mean we're, we're called to be a body of one people splitting things up because of opinions or etc have you ever been envious yeah uh, um, then just we'll leave it there we'll leave it there the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace forbearance kindness goodness faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. In the same letter, he says, if we sow to the flesh, if we don't deal with selfish ambition, fits of rage, jealousy, dissensions and factions and envy, and all these things, we're going to reap destruction. Don't mince his words, does it? Strong words. Strong words. God is speaking to the people of Israel, and he's going through all the things that they're doing, and he's summarizing and saying, look, you've gone away from me. You're going to get what you want, ultimately. Third and final one section, or is it, sorry, uh, third and second to last section, it says this, though Ephraim built many altars for sin offerings, they have become altars for sinning. 
I wrote for them the things of my law, but they regarded them as nothing, as something foreign. Though they offer sacrifices as gifts to me, and though they eat the meats, the Lord is not pleased with them, nor will he remember their wickedness and punish their sins. They will return to Egypt. Israel and her altars, they had history. There were places where people met with God. There were also places where people came to sincerely repent of sin. This verse is calling out insincerity. Okay, insincerity, the lack of understanding, which was their own fault. Why was it their fault? They had the law. No other nation had the law. So God says, I've given you this. This is a blessing. I've given you a Bible. Read the Bible. It's a blessing. And then if you read it, or you choose not to read it, then you're going to reap it. You're not sincere. Paul talks about this in Corinthians when he's talking about communion. He says this in 1 Corinthians 11, that if we were to take communion in an unworthy manner, not being sincere about our faith. But then he says that this unworthiness would lead individuals to be guilty. These are heavy words. And he says, so let that person examine himself. We've got communion today. I always forget when communion is, to be honest, but these are in my notes anyway. So let's take this from the Lord. Let us examine ourselves and to see if we can qualify to be the people of God. To compound this, he says, I wrote many things for them in my law. They regarded them as foreign. They are worshippers who attend the temple. They're on the brink of judgment. They do not know it. And this verse says that they offer sacrifices and eat meat, but God looks and sees it as being wicked. They are going through the motions. They're insincere about what they're doing, and what their responsibility is before the Lord. Assyria, it says, is pictured as an invading, conquering force. And then there's this reference to Egypt. And it's, a lot of people think it, that Assyria came, they took the majority of the people into captivity. Some people escaped to Egypt. But probably what it means here when this reference, they will return to Egypt, in the very last verse, is a state of slavery going back, going back to slavery. That's the picture. Christianity is only one direction, forwards. Forwards. No standing still, and certainly no backsliding. Last point, and then we're have, going to have communion, verse 14. Man-made trust. Verse 14, Israel has forgotten their maker and built palaces. Judah has fortified many towns but I will send fire on their cities. They will consume that, their fortresses. The opening verse sums up their, where they were at. They'd forgotten their maker. And in this forgetting, they look for help elsewhere. I'm going to say this as well, as an aside. This nation has a Christian heritage. It has a Christian heritage. Therefore, because it has a Christian heritage, we translated the Bible into the English language. We translated it from the Latin and the Greek. We did all these things in the name of God. You can go, you're not, it's not, no struggle to get a Bible. So if all of those things are true, and I think they are, then God, after he's given the people a word, like he's saying here, and they've rejected it, which is like what's happening in our nation, then the judgment will be a lot harsher. The judgment on the nation is a lot harsher because they've got the Bible. In places where they've got no Bible, it's different. But this nation, our nation, has a Bible, and that's a blessing. If we ignore that Bible, God says, there's a judgment coming. These cities that he's talking about here, they were fortified. Now, in a sense, if you are a nation, and you're a small nation, and you've got people around you that are going to be, you know, attacking you, then you'd fortify quite a few cities. So it's a wise approach. There's always going to be wars. There's always going to be a threat of wars. Salvation is not found in these cities. That's what God's saying. God saves. And if we align ourselves with him, we'll see him use us, use our abilities for his honor and his glory. These fortified cities were a man-made structure. They were useless against God. And all you get in, this, in, the, in the Bible is one little verse about what happened to these cities. There were 46 of them built, and it's one verse 
in chapter 18, 2 Kings verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against the fortified cities of Judah, which is what they built, and he took them. The only one survived, and that was Jerusalem. And the reason that Jerusalem survived was because of something Hezekiah did. And this is what it says about Hezekiah. Second Kings 19, verse 20, it tells us that Hezekiah, what he did to save this fortified city was this. The, the, the prophet comes up to him and he says, your prayer to me about Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Prayer, the prayer of faith, saved his city. Just like yours and my prayers will save this town and save families and save people, people that we've not even met yet. Proverbs 20, sorry, Psalms 20 verse 7. We're finishing now. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. The days and times that we live in, we have to find our faith in Christ alone. It can't go anywhere else. And maybe that's something that you're not used to hearing. Maybe that's something that is not uh, familiar with you. And the, the simple answer is, how do you get faith? Well, you get faith by hearing the word of God and by reading it. Bible says you need a mustard seed. But the mustard seed grows to be the largest plant. So our faith is not stagnant. So to summarize, it's never too late. You might have done things in the past and think, I've done things, God won't forgive me, he'll forgive you. It's never too late. Hold fast to his promises. We reap what we sow. Let us reflect now as we have our communion time. Let us reflect on what we're sowing. Are we sowing to the spirit? Or is the flesh still there? Bad habits, anger, jealousy, envy, gossip. Are those things evident in our lives? Do we need to give them to God? Christianity is a journey of one direction, forwards. And who are you putting your trust in? Is it the true King of Kings, Jesus? Let's bow our heads. Father, as we have our communion service now, Father, and um, we've talked about examining ourselves, I pray by your uh, Holy Spirit as you're amongst us that you would speak to us, speak to our hearts. Lord, we want to know if there are things within us that are just hindering what you want to do. Father, as we wait on you now, I pray that you bring to mind things that need to disappear from our character, from our life, whatever those things are, Lord. Just going to ask uh, Godfrey and Peter to come forward and we'll start our communion service. Uh, maybe Neil, can maybe just play the music of the last song in the background while we're doing that. Thank you. So communion is for um, our regular believers. It's those that they know they have faith. If you're unsure about that then you should let the communion table pass you by okay there's no obligation to take part but we are glad that you're with us so this is 1 corinthians 11 and this is what paul says when he reminds us about the lord's supper for i received from the lord what i also passed on to you the lord jesus the night he was betrayed he took bread when he had given thanks he broke it and he said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me.
if you could uh, start making your way, thank you. Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And let it go around me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you for this time together. We do thank you for your word to us this morning. We pray that we reflect deeply about our life, our character, our direction, Lord. God, you are good and gracious, and we stand under amazing grace.
we rejoice in your presence. In Jesus' name. Would you like to stand for the last hymn, please? <laughs> Sorry, wrong song, just hang fine. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong, a perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is written on his hands. we just pray and praise you this morning for the word that Nick's brought to us I just pray for anyone here who felt that the their heart has been touched by the, your word that they will have the courage to stand up and approach one of the leadership team they will have the courage to start praying to you and reading the bible and committing the life to you lord we just pray as we go into this week that you will bless each one of us that you will keep our eyes fixed on you and that we will want to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Please help yourself to refreshments at the back. Thank you. <laughs>